Hi everybody, I'm Melinda Gallant and I want to welcome you to another Cape Conversations. We have a very serious program today, a program that's vital and important to all of us and will affect us all at some point. So come along, let's have another Cape Conversations. Hi everybody, I am sitting here with a very, very lovely gentleman to talk about a very serious subject, Dr. Roger Gligler. How are you? I'm great, thanks so much for having me here today. Well, it's a serious subject, but I'm a, a, an Ohio farm girl. I grew up on a farm. So, uh, passing of time uh, with grandparents close by and and animals and friends and all kinds of family. The thought of, of how, you know, to everything there is a season um, was something that was just taught to me, uh, you know, through living on the farm, you know. And uh, that's what we're here to talk about, aren't we? Uh, we are. We're here to talk about end of life issue and one in particular which is whether we should have the option to be able to decide when our suffering is too much for us. Right, and you, oh gosh, you were a doctor, right? I mean, you, I mean, I you still are, you still are I a doctor. I am a doctor. You're just not a practicing doctor at this that's time. That's right. So when did, when, did, when did you start practicing? So I graduated from Georgetown in 1978, and then I trained in, um, internal medicine, which is the care of the of adult people. Mm -hmm. And I did primary care, which was um, directly taking care of people. And I got to work in um, upstate New York for a oh, year. Wow. And I was the second internist in the county oh, doing everything. And then I ended up going to Brockton, where I spent the rest of my career. And Brockton, is an underserved area. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do internal medicine the way internal medicine was designed. It doesn't exist this way anymore, mm -hmm. but I took care of my patients. My patients were mine to take care of. Mm -hmm. I'd take care of them in the office. If they got too sick, they'd go in the hospital and that. I'd be taking care of them. If they had a heart attack, I'd follow them in the intensive care unit. If they got sick, with a respiratory illness, needed to be on a ventilator, I'd follow them in the um, intensive care unit. So I did ICU, CCU work, and you know, as they um, deteriorated more, I might follow them in a nursing home. Oh, wow. So I really followed them throughout, and I dealt a lot with end of life issues, which mm -hmm. is, you know, as you say, being a farm girl, you realize we all get older, we all get sick, or we're, we all we're only die. We're so long. We and are. Some of us, you know, as somebody said to me once, Nobody puts an expiration date on the bottom of your foot when you're, you're born. You don't, you know, they don't. So it's, you know, everybody wants to live forever, but we don't. And how we go out is the way I would put it, and it's probably not as, as eloquent as you would say, uh, is very important and should be on our own terms. Well, I, I agree with you, and there, there's legislation that's at the State House. It's, this is, I think, the fifth time that it's been up there. And we're trying to get people to understand what the issue is so that we can have civil dialogue and that they can hopefully endorse it. Because most people, when you talk to them about what the issue is, don't want to suffer. And this is about giving people, at the end of their lives, an option for a certain subset of people who need this. Sure. So it's people who are adult, people who are terminally ill, mm -hmm. and who want, and they have to be the one to want it. It can't be family members or anyone else. The right to decide when they um, are, can't tolerate it anymore. It's not that they want to die, it's that well, they're nobody, dying. Nobody wants to die. Right and they just would be able to have the option to drink some medication, uh, to go to sleep and die in their sleep, which is what an awful lot of people want. 
So you actually right now are living with an illness, correct? I have cancer. I've had cancer now for 17 years. It's in Which my- Which is amazing. Yeah, it is. It's, thankfully it's slow growing. It's mm -hmm. prostate cancer, but mm -hmm. it is in my bones. And I you know, know that at the end that it will not be a, a pretty right, death. It won't be right. easy. It'll right. be painful. And I know that I will suffer. And I've taken care of people like myself. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had one that I gave um, palliative sedation or terminal sedation. He is suffering so much, even inside a you know, uh, nursing facility, we were not able to get him comfortable with all the medicines we could give him. Mm -hmm. And I put him on a morphine drip right. after talking with him and his family and he went to sleep and then, you know, subsequently died. Mm -hmm. and, and, well, I obviously, um, I'm of a certain age, so I've seen people, I've seen babies born and, and people pass away. Um, so, uh, and I have heard of this before, uh, you know, especially with the morphine drip. Um, yeah. So sometimes people ask why morphine drip and what's the problem with that? The medical aid in dying and the legislation is an act um, um, regarding end of life options. And so the option is the key word. So people shouldn't have to get to the point where their suffering is unbearable, that they're in uncontrollable pain in order to make a decision to end their lives. And it should really be in their hands. Um, the legislation calls that people are evaluated by two different doctors. They have to evaluate that they have a terminal illness mm -hmm. and that they're mentally competent. They need to see a, a mental health professional um, so that they can be judged that no depression or other issue is causing problems. Mm -hmm. They have to request this over time. It's um, 15 days apart. They have to make an oral request and then a written request. It has to be witnessed, has to be witnessed by people who are disinterested. The person has to be given um, the option to withdraw the request at any time mm -hmm. and they have to be asked you know, multiple times. It's optional for the patient, it's optional for the doctor, and it's optional for the pharmacist to be involved. So those are some of the major uh, safeguards. Sure. And it's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. So in 1997, it started in Oregon, in yeah, this I, country. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and so it's been going on for 21 years. And there's been no abuse with it. So there's not- It's in Washington state as well, it's correct? In, yeah, it's in uh, seven states. So um, Oregon, Washington, California, Hawaii, uh, Colorado, Montana, Vermont, and the District of Columbia. <laughs> Isn't that ironic that it's in the District of Columbia? <laughs> it is, it is. It was hard getting it through there I because the- not because of their legislature, but because they have to go through the uh, Congress right. also to get it through. Well, if it went through Congress for D.C., why doesn't it just go through Congress for the United States? So these are state laws. I see. And the legislature, um, the congressional legislature mm -hmm. has the right to review laws in, I see. in, so that's why in the District of Columbia. Right. They don't have the freedom to just be able to pass their own legislation. What well, doesn't make sense to me though, if it's in Washington, California, and Oregon, if it's in Colorado, if it's in DC, and it's in Vermont, it would just seem to me that in Massachusetts, although a very, um, I know it's a very Catholic, uh, with all due respect to all my Catholic friends, is a very Catholic state. It has a, I mean, the, the diocese of, of, for Massachusetts and all, has a real hold on this state. Is that the issue or well, is it less than that? So the question is, why, why not Massachusetts? Yeah, basically. <laughs> so 
all demographics support this. It, you go across Democrat, Republican, Catholic, Jewish, atheist, you know, Hispanic, African American, whatever. It's every demographic by an absolute majority. Physicians also yeah. all support this. So we had an initiative in 2012, mm -hmm. and um, there were a group of people, including the Catholic Archdiocese, mm -hmm. who were opposed to this, and they dumped in a lot of money, mm -hmm. and money controls campaigns, sure. and they had disinformational campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, it ended up being rejected 51 to 49 percent. It was very close, and it's been in the legislature. And part of what we're doing now, part of why I'm here, I'm a volunteer for Compassion and Choices. Um, and that's what the movement is called, correct? Well, that, they're working mm -hmm. to help move this uh, legislation okay. through. So I'm working for them, and we're trying to get the word out. We're trying to educate people about this. Now, this is a short time that we're talking. I'm going to be giving a talk at the Sandwich Public Library. Yes, coming at, up. At 1 o'clock on March 30th. Excellent. So hopefully your viewers will come. They'll be able to ask me questions. I'm happy to do that. Sure. And we're trying to organize in the Cape so that people understand what the issue is. But when I talk to most people, and I tend to ask them, you know, what's your understanding about this? Most people have seen a really bad death. Mm. And, you know, that's, it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And this isn't going to make death good, but it's going to help to improve the option. And it's for a very small number of people who need it. So it's about three to four in a thousand deaths mm -hmm. end up using medical aid and dying. And that's based upon the statistics from Oregon. Mm -hmm. where they've had this in place for 21 years. It's a bit, oh yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, so it's not a lot of people, but it's really important. And a lot of people, or a lot more people get the medication than don't use it. So about a third of people get the medication, they don't use it, and um, they die without having this, um, right. this need. Pass. And the medication is collected the same way hospice medications are. You know, you get bottles of morphine. Those are all picked up. There are, you know, regulation right. on how to do it. So that's not an issue. But it causes peace of mind for the people who have this so that they know that if things keep getting worse and they're out of control with their symptoms, mm -hmm. they can, and, you know, decide when it's enough. And it's only the individual who can decide upon whether or not to have medical aid in dying and to use it. They have to ask. No one else can ask for them. They have to be capable of doing this. So making it's not the decision mentally. making the decision. And if they're not, you know, they are not eligible to get it. So um, <clears throat> you mentioned hospice, hospice and palliative care. So are they a supporter of this as well? Um, the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Care um, does, does support this. It's, you know, but it's a large medical organization sure. that's involved. I've been working with you know, a large number of doctors. Mm -hmm. This actually improves the use of hospice and palliative care. Mm -hmm. It sounds funny um, that it does. But in Oregon, it's doubled the use of hospice. Um, so the people yeah. say, oh, I'm going to do this. Right, so doctors become better able to deal with end of life issues and I better see. able to have conversations and more likely to recommend that their patients use hospice towards the end of their life. And hospice is wonderful. This yes, is not yes. an anti-hospice. I, I have seen hospice work, so. Right. It, hospice extends life by five weeks over usual medical care. Right. And the use of hospice is more appropriate mm -hmm. in Oregon than it is elsewhere. The other nice thing is that more people die at home 
than die in the hospital in Oregon. It's the only state where that has taken, um, takes place. Mm -hmm. And most people, if you ask them, uh, want to die at home. So 70% of the people in the Commonwealth are in support of this. So we're trying to get people to understand the issue deeper and to um, endorse this legislation. So will it go back on a ballot again or no? It's Right now it's going through the uh, legislature. I see. So, it's, so uh, our representative will be have to vote one way or another at right. some point. So um, Randy Hunt, I right. believe, is, that is, our representative. Yep. is your rep and your senator is uh, Vinny DiMacito? Yep. Okay. So people who are, you know, have feelings about this should call up Randy Hunt and say, you know, we're in support of H1926, um, an act regarding end of life options. Mm -hmm. And to DiMacito, it's S2208. Um, We're going to run it along the bottom of this, <laughs> so, so everybody will have all the, the information they need. Good, good. And it's calling works the best, and your legislators need to know that you don't want to have to suffer at the end of your life, and that you don't want your family members to have to suffer when there's an option for you. You can choose not to use it, right. and that's fine. And m most people don't use it, and many people don't need it. In, in this in this day and age, though, where everybody is talking about their rights, my right for this, my right to own guns, my right to do that, my everything is about rights, right? Correct. I'm a, you know. There's a lot of rights. <laughs> There's a lot of rights out there. That's I guess my biggest question is then why would anybody? be against this? Is it because they think somebody will abuse the system? Is it uh, because they think, oh, people just want to commit suicide? I mean, I know this might be a strange question, but... So let's um, deal with the suicide question, because yeah. that's big. There are two things. Is it suicide? Is this euthanasia? Right. And I feel that it's neither. So euthanasia is what you did in the farm mm -hmm. or that's at correct. the vet. Right. So it's where someone else sees a person or an animal who's suffering and terminal and right. is put down. So it's an injection by someone else. This is an individual doing it, doing, but taking the medicine and drinking it themselves. So it's not euthanasia. So what is suicide? Suicide is when someone has a mental issue and they're not able to think straight, so they have some psychological issue, right. and they decide to kill themselves, although they're not having you know, end-of-life issues or suffering. So for example, someone who jumps off a building commits suicide. Right. For those of um, your audience who remember 9-11, right. on 9-11, there were people who were trapped on the top floors of the World Trade and they threw Center. Themselves out the building. And some of them jumped off. So the question for the medical examiner is, did they commit suicide? Right. And so he decided, after a lot of thought, that they did not die of suicide, that they didn't go to work. And planned to do And planned to die that it, they made a rational, autonomous decision that they would be better off jumping from the building than dying in the conflagration that happened. Right. And so he said that they died from an act of terrorism. Mm -hmm. There are other examples that are similar to this, mm -hmm. but people who use medical aid in dying don't want to die. They put it off for as long as they can tolerate Certainly. things but they are going to die, and most of them are going to die fairly shortly. So it's a question whether some people believe that suffering is good. And there's some people who have religious is there objections. Somebody, wait, is there somebody out there that believes suffering is good? Oh, there is. There really? Is. Yeah, if you go on the um, and look at the chat rooms and the websites, um, they will talk about that, you know, um, God has put suffering in the world and people are supposed to suffer and it gives them enlightenment. I guess they're thinking about a different God than I am. Well, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's the issue. <laughs> For people who feel that suffering is fine, right. if they want to go that way, that's okay. But mm -hmm. I feel that, you know, I don't want to have mm -hmm. to suffer. 
you know, if I choose to, you know, try and live my life with my suffering, that's okay. It goes across, a, you know, a couple of different religions sure. and people feel that way. So I'm not, you know, I'm just saying that, you know, we should have freedom of choice in this and because your religion prohibits it, if you want to follow that, that's fine. But, you know, a lot of people violate their religious tenets and it's their choice. So, for example, birth control. Right. Things along those lines may or may not be against someone's religious teaching. Right. But it's an individual decision. Well, and as a, a society, right. we give um, people the right to practice birth control. So that's an example of this. Do you counsel people who are in this situation or do you if somebody called you and said can you can you help me here can you I know that you know at, at some point because of what I, the disease that I have I'm going to die I've been told I'm and I'm going to go back to the uh, expiration date nobody knows exactly when they're going to die it just depends right W would you guide them or would you send them to uh, a group to help them or well compassion and choices um, the, the group that I work with uh -huh. will counsel people and they help them how to make decisions mm -hmm. at the end of life I see. I'm also involved with um, litigation and there'll be a loss there be a hearing on a lawsuit that I'm involved with to say that there is no law um, in the Commonwealth that prevents medical aid and dying from being used. So there's a hearing on March 26th, um, but it's a long process. It's been going on for over two years now. So what happens at the end of that? Is, do you want a positive outcome, obviously? But we what do. would that positive outcome be? That positive outcome would be an admission um, that there is no law prohibiting people from using medical aid and dying, and it's fine for them to have these discussions with their doctors. So I don't want to be in the position myself oh, yes. of, of, doing, you, of advising people on medical aid and dying. I want it to be done uh, the proper way, Through with the doctor. proper safeguards, with the proper doctor, and understanding it. I feel that the individual has the right to be able to do this. The Supreme Court has ruled otherwise that it's up to the state to do. They don't find that it is covered under the federal um, constitution. Um, in Montana, um, Montana developed medical aid and dying in their state. Of all places, Montana, well, which is a very conservative state. It's also libertarian. Yeah. And so they like didn't rule on the constitutionality of it, mm -hmm. um, although I believe that their constitution, if push came to shove, would uh, protect the individual's right to do that. But in Massachusetts, my attorneys tell me that there is no law prohibiting medical aid in dying. So right. we're getting the courts to do that, and we're, or we're asking the courts to do that, and we're asking for what's called an affirmative dis defense which is if a doctor counsels a person at the end of life mm -hmm. that they cannot be um, uh, tried for manslaughter. Okay. okay. So you're going to speak at the Sandwich Public Library on March 30th at what time again? One, one o'clock in the afternoon. One o'clock. And do you know where you will be in the library? Upstairs? Downstairs? Or? I, I don't know. Okay. All right. And you're looking for a nice turnout, I would think. It's, I mean, it's something, we're, we're an aging population on Cape Cod. So, I mean, seriously, we, we all, are. We are very, very much aging. And we want to organize sandwich with people who are working here mm -hmm. in the town. So people who come can sign a petition, let us know that Excellent. they're in favor of it. Yeah. And eventually what we'd like to do is get parts of Sandwich to endorse it. So in Falmouth, where I live, mm -hmm. we've gotten the uh, Board of Selectmen to endorse medical aid and dying. We have several religious institutions. Excellent. Um, we're working with other civic groups to endorse this. So what we're trying to do is get people to not only support it, 
but to come out and let become visible about their sure. support so sure. that the legislature says, so that Randy Hunt and Vinny DiMacito say, right. gee, this is something that's really important to the people I represent, mm -hmm. and I should do my job representing them. Right. And well, I should. Sometimes that's, uh, sometimes we don't know how that's going to turn out. And that just happened recently with one of our representatives that many of us are very upset about. So we won't get into it, but it's just yeah. disappointing. Let's just put it that way. So I believe that the representatives sometimes try and represent us if they understand what that is. this is very important to, um, to the people who they represent. Right. And so hearing from a broad range of people, sure. And as I said, conservatives, liberals, Republicans, Democrats, libertarians, <laughs> you know, all, all are in support right. of this. Right. And so letting, the, letting your legislators know no, is the best way. Is the best way. And Excellent. becoming visible, a visible supporter. Right, right. Well, I want to thank you for taking time. I know you're a very busy man. So I want to thank you so much for taking time with me today. A tough subject. You're very articulate. You know, I can tell you were a practicing physician for many years talking to people. Um, and I just really appreciate it. Thank you again for being You're here. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Excellent. And I hope to see a lot of your audience in, uh, at Sandwich Public well, Library. Well, we're going we're to share this up real quick. <laughs> OK. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Oh my goodness, Dr. Roger Kligler, what a wonderful man. And he's giving us solace in knowing that he is trying to help us make choices in our lives and at the end of our lives, ones that should be our own choice. So I wanna thank you for coming with me today on this journey and I'll see you next time on another Cape Conversations.